we've been discussing conformal mapping and how we can use it to help us solve boundary value problems such as the Laplace equation in various contexts. We've discussed conformal mapping itself and how to utilize it and some of its properties. We also discussed solutions of two canonical Dirichlet problems that give us additional targets into which we can try to conformally map our complicated domains in the z-plane. And finally, we want to focus on an additional application to fluid flows. We've already looked at steady heat conduction, we've looked at electrostatics, and we're going to look at a third example in more detail here in order to pull a lot of this stuff together. So how we solve Laplace's equation, how we do the conformal mapping, and so forth in this context of potential fluid flow. So we'll run through the formulation in this video, and then in subsequent videos we'll do a number of examples and show how powerful this is. So we've illustrated uh, in the last couple examples how we can treat steady heat conduction as well as electrostatics. As I've said in each of those examples, we can couch it in terms of any one of these physical phenomena that are governed by Laplace's equation, and now we'll add fluid flow to that, that list. It's also called ideal fluid flow because, as you'll see, there's a number of assumptions that have to be made, so it's a highly idealized fluid flow situation, but more commonly we refer to it as potential flow. Okay, so let's talk about the potential flow formulation. Now, if you remember from the heat conduction discussion as well as the electrostatics discussion, I did this from the outside looking in. We started with the most general form of the governing equation. We made the necessary assumptions to get down to Laplace's equation for the, the situation that we cared about. Here, I'm going to do the exact opposite. Turns out the governing equations and Navier Stokes equations are highly complex, highly nonlinear partial differential equations. Instead, here I'm going to use the inductive approach whereby I'll take some basic principles of fluid mechanics and apply them mathematically and see what the governing equations happen to be. Of course, they'll be Laplace's equation. I will highlight clearly in blue the assumptions. So as we go through, take note of the assumptions that we're making, and I'll be introducing a number of equations and terms along the way. Those will be in red. Okay, so the first two assumptions are two-dimensionality, of course, because of the requirement for using complex variable theory. And the first main assumption is that the flow is incompressible. So if it's incompressible, that means that it can change shape, but it can't expand or contract. It can't be compressed. Mathematically, what that means is that the divergence of the velocity field has to be zero. So the divergence del dot v, so the divergence of some vector field, represents it, its expansion or contraction. And so if it can't expand or contract, if it's incompressible, as in the case of liquids and low-speed gases, then del dot v would be zero. Well, del is the gradient operator, so that's partial partial xi plus partial partial yj, and then the dot product with the velocity vector, which is given here is capital V, which is vxi plus vyj, well, that would give us this. So partial Vx, partial x, plus partial Vy, partial y would be zero, where you see Vx and Vy are the x and y components of the velocity vector. Okay, so this is what we call the continuity equation. It enforces conservation of mass within the fluid. We can define a very helpful quantity in fluid mechanics, and that's the stream function. We denote it by psi, it's a two-dimensional function of x and y, and it's defined in terms of the velocity components. So Vx is partial psi partial y, and Vy is minus partial psi partial x. Now mathematically, the reason why we define it in this way is if you take this expression for Vx and Vy, substitute it back into the continuity equation, you'll see that it's identically satisfied for any psi. So mathematically, it looks like this definition of the stream function is just a cute little way to actually get rid of the continuity equation because any psi will satisfy it identically. Instead, uh, let me show you how important a quantity this is and how physically relevant the stream function is. All right, so the stream function, again, is a two-dimensional function psi of x, y. Stream lines will be lines of constant stream functions. So just like isotherms are lines of constant temperature, lines of constant stream function are called streamlines. So let's think about how does psi behave along a streamline. Well, if the streamline is a line of constant psi, then its differential is zero. So let's see what that means. Let's write the differential of psi. It's partial psi partial x dx plus partial psi partial y dy. And then again, that's equal to zero because we're applying this along a streamline. 
Well, because that's equal to zero, we can solve for dy dx. That's the slope of the streamline. So the slope would be minus partial psi partial x over partial psi partial y. However, from back here, minus partial psi partial x, well, that's just vy. And partial psi partial y, well, that's just vx. So we see that the slope of the streamlines are actually in the direction of the velocity vector. So this is really powerful. So if we were to plot the streamlines, lines of constant psi for a flow, they actually show us the direction of the fluid flow. At every point along the streamline, the velocity vectors are everywhere tangent to the streamlines. So they show us the, the directions that the flow is flowing, is moving. So this is really a very powerful tool. And you'll find in fluid mechanics, it's very often that in, under, in order to understand a flow, in order to interpret a flow, we'll often plot the streamlines in order to help us do that. And you'll notice no additional assumptions have been made, just that it's incompressible. It's the only assumption that we need to make in order to lead to the stream function. Now, another quantity that we like to look at in fluid mechanics is known as the vorticity, denoted by omega. Here, it's again a function of x and y. So we have del cross v. So the curl, or the cross product of the gradient with a vector, it is in some way representing a rotation. So the vorticity is a measure of the rotation of the individual fluid particles. Now normally, vorticity would be a vector, so it would have three components in the x, y, and z direction. However, in the two-dimensional case, it's actually a scalar, and its direction is actually normal to the x, y plane. So it's a scalar omega. And it's just partial vy, partial x, minus partial vx, partial y. That's the, the curl of the velocity vector. OK, so that's omega. That's the definition of the vorticity. Now, if the flow is irrotational, which is just a fancy way of saying it doesn't have any vorticity, the fluid particles are not rotating, then the vorticity, del cross v, will be equal to 0. There's no vorticity. Now there's a vector identity which says that the curl of the gradient of any scalar function is zero. That's a vector identity, has nothing to do with fluid mechanics. You can prove this for any general situation. So we can write del cross del phi is equal to zero. So this is the curl of the gradient of a scalar, the scalar being phi here. So I don't know what phi is yet, it's just a scalar function that I've used to define this vector identity. Okay, so if the curl of v is equal to zero, and if the curl of the gradient of phi is equal to zero, that means v is equal to the gradient of this scalar function phi. All right, so let's just see where that leads us. So the velocity vector is equal to the gradient of the phi function, the scalar phi function. The velocity is vxi plus vyj. And the gradient of a scalar is partial phi partial xi plus partial phi partial yj. So these are two vectors. They have to be equal. So the components are the same. So vx is equal to partial phi partial x. And vy is equal to partial phi partial y. Now you say, well, that looks kind of like the stream function because it's representing the velocity components in terms of the scalar function, now phi. However, these are, are a little bit different. You know, it's, it's vx partial phi partial x and vy partial phi partial y. We call phi now, which was just this arbitrary scalar function that we introduced, we call that the velocity potential. It's a potential. It acts like the electrostatic potential that we have discussed in the past. It's what, in a sense, drives the flow. And it is related to the velocity. So the velocity of the streamlines in the direction of the velocity vectors will be normal to the isopotential lines, the lines of constant phi. So this is another quantity that's useful and helpful for us to track within now potential flow because we've made an additional assumption that the flow is irritational in order for this quantity to have any mathematical and physical meaning. All right, so it's the velocity potential. It's a potential in the, in the general context that we've used that term in the past. All right, what would happen if we were to substitute these definitions of the velocity potential into the continuity equation? Again, the continuity equation is involving vx and vy. If I substitute these in, what you'll notice is we get a Laplace equation. So the velocity potential phi has to satisfy 
Laplace's equation. Therefore, it could be the real, it could be the imaginary part of an analytic function. All right, so that's, that's helpful. Now, what about psi? Well, let's see what happens to psi. If I substitute the definitions of the stream function into that of vorticity, so that means I'm going to take these definitions of the stream function and I'm going to substitute them in here for vx and vy into the definition of the vorticity. Well, we now get an equation that looks like this. Partial squared psi partial x squared plus partial squared psi partial y squared is equal to minus omega, the negative of the vorticity. So we almost have another Laplace equation in this case. This is actually called a Poisson equation. So a Poisson equation is a non-homogeneous Laplace equation, essentially. They're both smart French guys, so, so they get along well. All right. Now, remember, however, we assume that the flow is irrotational. So if it's irritational, that means there is no vorticity. So look what we have. We have another quantity, in this case psi, the stream function, that also has to satisfy Laplace's equation. So it's exactly what we want. We have an analytic function, you'll see this in a moment, where the real and imaginary parts both have physical meaning, phi and psi. Now let's just compile the assumptions that we've made. Of course, two-dimensionality, incompressible in viscid, and irrotational, so we call that ideal or potential flow. Now even with all these assumptions, it turns out that this potential flow theory is very much in common use today. It's used in aerodynamics and other contexts as well. Not usually as the final simulation or the final analysis of the flow, but as a first pass. Now for you non-fluid dynamicists, you're, you're thinking like this little squirrel here, you know, that's enough fluid mechanics, let's move on. Uh, so yeah, this was fluid mechanics heavy. In the end, we have two quantities, phi and psi, even using the same notation as before, they just now have fit different physical meaning. So phi and psi, the, they're harmonic conjugates of one another, they satisfy Laplace's equation, could be the real and imaginary parts of an analytic function. So uh, don't worry our little squirrel here, we're gonna move on here. All right, so let's take a look at the velocity potential and the stream function. It's just a phi and a psi. In, the, in this context, they have physical meaning in a fluid mechanical sense, but they're just two harmonic functions. So the kosher riemann equations then, the u becomes phi and the v becomes psi, our real parts and our imaginary parts. So what you'll notice is that from the definitions of the stream function and velocity potential, stream function and velocity potential, the kosher riemann equations then are actually expressions for vx and vy. We have partial phi partial x is equal to partial psi partial y. Well, that's vx. Likewise, we have partial phi partial y is equal to minus partial psi partial x. Well, that's just vy. So the marriage between the mathematics and the physics is just really very beautiful here. As we've done before, we'll define a complex function, capital phi of z, it has the real part being phi plus i times psi, the imaginary part, and now the phi and the psi represent fluid mechanical quantities. So we'll call this the complex potential function. Again, it's a complex function, and it describes potential flow. Okay, so we have this analytic function as we have in the past. Real and imaginary parts have physical meaning. What about the derivative? If we take the derivative d phi dz, what does that represent? Well, let's try it. So d cap phi dz is equal to partial psi partial y minus i partial phi partial y, or partial phi partial x plus i partial psi partial x. Those are again from equations 1.8 and 1.9 that we had when we derived the kosher riemann equations in the first place. We've been using these a number of times throughout chapters one and chapters two. So in either case, whichever one you choose, well, that's just vx minus i times vy. So this is vx, this, or this is vx, and this is vy, minus vy. All right, so that will denote by the complex conjugate of w. w is the complex velocity. You could have a complicated velocity. This is the complex velocity. So it's a complex function of z. It's the complex conjugate, because we have this minus sign in here. So w would be vx plus i vy. The point being, again, as we've seen before, phi has a physical meaning, real and imaginary parts, 
and phi prime also has physical meaning, real and imaginary parts. In this case, it's related to the velocity components themselves. So you're actually going to see there's three ways we can get velocity components. We can get them from the complex velocity function here. We can get them from the velocity potential, little phi, and or we can get them from the string function, psi. So and I'll actually il illustrate in a later video how that works. All right, a number of remarks about this. So as we've seen all along, the mathematics tells us something about the physics. In this case, we have lines of constant psi, which are everywhere tangent to the velocity vectors, so they show the direction that the velocity is moving throughout the fluid. And then perpendicular, or orthogonal to those, we have lines of constant phi. Those are the equipotential lines, lines of constant velocity potential. And that is, in a sense, what's driving, what's pushing the flow along the streamlines. So again, this orthogonality of these two functions has physical meaning and it makes sense intuitively. Now, remember we said the flow was not viscous, it was inviscid. So that means there's no frictional effects. So the fluid particles just slide smoothly across each other with no friction between them. So what that means is you can think of any streamline in a flow as a solid surface. And this co actually comes in quite handy when doing problems because there's an infinity of streamlines. Any one of those streamlines could be considered a surface. Generally, in a real viscous fluid, there's actually what's called a no-slip condition, and the velocity at a wall, at a surface of the, of the fluid, is zero. In potential flow, that's not the case. So any streamline could be regarded as a surface. That's not true in viscous flows, but it is true in, in viscid flows. Okay, so that leads to this last statement here. In viscous flow, all solid surfaces are streamlines, but not all streamlines may be considered solid surfaces. So you just have to be careful about generalizing this to the viscous case, but we can take advantage of this in the inviscid case. This is very helpful as well, stagnation points. So a stagnation point is just what it sounds like. It's a point in the flow where the flow is stagnant. The fluid is not moving, its velocity vector is zero. Well, if the velocity vector is zero, Vx is zero, Vy is zero, then the complex conjugate of W is also zero. Well, that's d phi dz. So we're gonna see a very interesting connection between stagnation points and mappings uh, later on, but for now, we can see that d phi dz, which is the complex conjugate of w, will be zero whenever we have a stagnation point. This is what I just mentioned a moment ago, where we can get the velocity components from the velocity potential, the stream function, or the complex velocity, or it's, of course, complex conjugate. Now we can do everything, of course, in polar coordinates as well. We have the cauchy riemann equations in polar coordinates. We have a velocity vector in polar coordinates. Uh, here are the cauchy riemann equations, and they relate back to the vr, v theta, and so forth, just like the, uh, the Cartesian case. Here's Laplace's equation in polar coordinates, same as we've seen before. And also, the complex kind of the complex velocity, still d phi dz, but it's now vr minus i v theta, all times e to the minus i theta. So you just have to remember this e to the minus i theta factor when you're extracting out the vrs and the v thetas from the complex conjugate of W. Okay, so we've seen a number of applications. Uh, there are others that we have not even mentioned, but I've compiled a list of them, them here. So they're all governed by Laplace's equation. They all have a phi and a psi that have physical meaning. And so we saw heat conduction, where the phi's are the isotherms, lines of constant phi, and lines of constant psi are the heat flux lines. Electrostatics, we have the electrostatic potential, as well as the current flow lines. Potential flow, which is what we're looking at here. We have the velocity potential and the streamlines. Elasticity, gravitational fields, magnetism, all of these have different interpretations for what the phi and the psi represent. But again, in any of these contexts, we have Laplace's equation governing the physics, so therefore we can use complex variable theory, conformal mapping, and so forth to help us solve these problems.